Digital Decisions Panel, the impact of digital media on individuals, organizations, and society. My name is Barbara McGloin. I'm an Associate Director of Career Development with the Career Design Lab. The focus of our panel for the next hour will be to examine the impact of digital media. So let me just read the description so we can all start from the same reference point. Likely no force has caused more disruption across multiple industries than the rise of digital media. This diverse panel of experts from a variety of sectors will share their insights, both positive and critical, on this crucial topic. So after we um, listen to our panelists for the next hour from 9 to 9.30, we'll take questions and leave some time to continue networking. Let me introduce the, our moderator so that we can begin. Dr. J.D. Schramm, who is our panel moderator tonight. Many of you have already met him and know him uh, through other uh, interactions at Columbia. He is the senior lecturer and faculty director, Career Design Lab, San Francisco, Columbia SBS. So J.D. joined Columbia this summer, just weeks before our first cohort of master's students began their studies in San Francisco. He teaches strategic communication and oversees academics for all of the programs offered by Columbia on the West Coast. He founded and led the communication curriculum efforts at Stanford's Graduate School of Business until this year. Lucky for us. <laughs> Before that, he served on the faculty at NYU Stern School of Business. So a warm welcome for JD, and he'll begin the panel and introduce you to our uh, panelist. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, truly appreciate you foregoing the State of the Union address this evening to be able to be here with us. Uh, right before we began, one of the panelists said, why are there nine chairs in the front row that are marked reserved? We think the Supreme Court justices may join us here. And so uh, if, if nine people walk in in black robes, that was, uh, was all a part of our original design. Uh, I am delighted to be able to be facilitating this conversation uh, with all of you, and uh, I very much want to keep it a conversation. You are more so here to hear from the experts and the professionals in the room uh, who are going to share their insights around uh, the disruption that has happened in so many different fields uh, because of the rise of digital media. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation up here for a bit. We may not do the full hour uh, just with the, the six of us, uh, but uh, we're gonna have a few questions that I tee up and ask the, the panel to answer. And then I definitely will uh, turn it over to you in the room uh, to be able to ask questions. Uh, there is a single mic when we get to that point, and we'll just ask you to queue up there and ask your questions from the microphone. So as we go through the first part, if there are areas you wish we would go into greater depth or something you wanna challenge uh, or question or add to, uh, note that and there will be time uh, for you to do that in a moment. I uh, have given the panel very little guidance about what is about to happen uh, because I like to keep it interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, the first question that I'm gonna pose, and we're just gonna go straight down the line. So Rashan, you have the most time to prep for it. Perfect. Um, <laughs> why are you here? Like what about your career sets you up to be an expert on a panel in digital media? Let us know a little bit of the journey that brought you here and what expertise you have to share with all of us. And we'll start with Carla. Okay, great. I have the least time to prepare for that. <laughs> <laughs> I have been in marketing communications for... Down a little closer. I've been in marketing communi communications now for about 25 years. I started off on client side, uh, had exposure in South Africa to a company that was just uh, dipping their toe into digital media at the time and got to look at marketing communications as a, a, a channel to solve business problems from company side. I went from there to an agency, ended up doing a little bit of consulting for a while, um, ended up at another agency, and I find myself now at an integrated communications company that has its history in PR. And I find that just from a my career standpoint, it's something that just never goes away. 
Um, I don't know that I would call myself an expert. I think that the environment is so rapidly changing. Um, every day there is an, a different platform to explore. Um, our clients uh, struggle with tremendous complexity in their own organizations. So we find ourselves really navigating the intersection of marketing um, and like, traditional communications departments and marketing departments who've got very different goals, but are ultimately trying to uh, broker relationships with consumers that are authentic and rich and long-standing. So I would say that, uh, like you, I've just been potentially exposed to it for a little bit longer, really navigating the intersection of um, what digital means uh, to individuals and, and how we relate to brands. Excellent. And the nice thing about being on a panel like this is you don't have to call yourself an expert. I get to call all of you experts. <laughs> so you can update your LinkedIn profiles after we're done here. Don't go in right now. Um, but but your expertise is valued, and we appreciate it. Is Welcome. officially sanctioned by Columbia? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Excellent. Lee Bollinger, we talked about it this morning. He's good with it all. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, my name is Steven Latosinix, and I am CEO of a company called SlideShop. Uh, we are an e-commerce uh, website that sells digital marketing assets. Um, I think my perspective today will be informed, much like yours, with a career that's a little bit varied. I spent a lot of time in management consulting early on in my career. Mm -hmm have worked for some, some big organizations, and then the, probably the last 10 years been in more entrepreneurial organizations. Um, and what we're trying to do as a company today is really disrupt the more traditional markets. Mm -hmm. And so in, in, in the same sort of way that um, Squarespace or Wix have dis disrupted what's going on in the web development side, mm -hmm. we're trying to disrupt a lot of what's happening in marketing. And so I think that's, that's the perspective that, that I'll come to this from tonight. Excellent, thanks Stephen. Aaron? Hi everyone, I'm Erin Thrope. Um, my title is actually Expert Digital Media. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of those where like, you read it and you're like, that is so presumptuous. <laughs> but it's one of those things where if anything, I think we're an expert in adapting mm -hmm. and just being flexible. Uh, if you pursue a career in digital, invariably there will be mergers and acquisitions and different logos and different platforms. And one day you're like really good at one thing and then they change the whole game. And Facebook says, guess what? You're running fully automated campaigns now and you have to restructure everything at the campaign level. Um, so I think, um, yes, expert digital media. Um, my background is in paid search and analytics. Um, I started, I bought a one-way ticket from UCLA uh, right after college. I came here in 2010. I got a job thinking I was going to be an actress. I actually got a job as doing paid search and business development at a paid search agency. Um, then moved to Universal McCann and kind of saw the larger media landscape. Then it all came full circle. I ended up working at a digital media agency just for Broadway. So I worked on Frozen and Lion King and Phantom of the Opera. Any fans out there? <laughs> yeah. Woo. Um, so that was my world. And then just because, you know, again, experts at adapting, I, I'm trying my hand at management consulting now. And I'm a uh, non-traditional hire of Bain, uh, <laughs> meaning that I come from the digital side. <laughs> non-traditional means you don't have to have an MBA. I don't have an MBA. Uh, I couldn't handle supply chain management to save my life. Um, but I know digital. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Of your. So I neither have the title of expert or non-traditional hire. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the brand studio director uh, at Gensler. Uh, we're a, a firm that has 6,000 employees in 48 cities, uh, networked across Asia, um, the Middle East, Europe, Australia, and um, the Americas. So uh, what's really interesting in our firm is we're, we're working with 3,500 clients at any given time, basically in every industry. And uh, we have worked really hard to connect all of our employees together. And we're seeing three significant trends that I wanted to share about today. So as we start this conversation, one is the advent of the automated driverless, the adoption of the driverless car, which is actually significantly changing the design of future buildings and giving uh, the streets back to the people. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. The second trend is um, co-working, which is actually uh, changing the way that developers and businesses are making their real estate decisions. And the third trend um, that we're involved in is that um, retail is being redefined uh, beyond being transactional to being something about uh, customer experience. So it's a really interesting time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thanks, Javier. Yeah. George? Thank you. So good evening, everyone. George Creppy. I am at Bank of America. I've been there for about five years. I'm a 
communications executive by title, but what does that mean? So my team is responsible for communications both internally, say employee engagement is what we call it in short, and then media relations for the global risk organization. So the chief risk officer as well as his 5,500 or some odd people that are in fact global. As you know, Bank of America is largely in the US, but there are some international aspects of the company. So put that aside. I've been in financial services for just north of 20 years in various capacities, started in marketing, then kind of migrated into communications, spent some time at <clears throat> Citigroup, JP Morgan, <laughs> Lehman Brothers, <laughs> stayed on at Barclays for a little while after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, can talk about that during drinks, um, and then got my way into UBS and then Bank of America. So. Digital impacting us, I mean, look, obviously a lot of this, you interact with Bank of America in many different ways. Uh, you may come through various channels, apps, brick and mortar, internet. But, you know, internally it's also fascinating to me, my personal connection to digital is very different than sometimes what you wind up working on internally in that I'm on perhaps not as much as others, but Instagram, Facebook, you know, I'm fascinated by the interactions and what it's doing to society. But internally, in order to get through certain steps, in order to get something published, you know, we're not out there necessarily. We're, we're pretty quick, but we're not <laughs> as quick as some organizations when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, how we do what we do, and that's because we're a highly regulated, obviously, uh, institution. So happy to talk about what all that means um, in practice uh, throughout the night. And Rashan. You've had time now. So. I've, I've completely it misused that time. It, it better be a really good answer, because you, you've had more time than anybody. No but pressure, just go ahead. I was listening so carefully that I was not <laughs> plotting my, my statement. So my name is Rashan Richards. Um, I'm the maybe accidental CEO and co-founder of a small software company, small but mighty. We have 50 employees in the US and Central Europe. Um, I guess my angle on communication or digital and all of those things is that my, both my academic work and then this company that kind of spawned from it we're focused on how emerging technologies, especially those that allow people to be more visual and mediate distance and time, can be used to, I guess, support or uh, amplify the type of connection that you might have sitting in person with somebody, but while separated by distance. So we make a digital whiteboard platform, uh, but it's really focused on the kind of human intimate closeness of building and sharing ideas. It started around in education, how do we let young people have more visual, more multimedia ways to communicate their understanding? And then that started to spawn into other areas of school and then ultimately uh, into other industries. So, you know, the company's, the product is like nine years old. The company as it is now is four years old. And um, yeah, it, it's used all around the world. Excellent. And we, we purposely wanted to have people on the panel that came from a diversity of backgrounds, a diversity of industries. Uh, there are some interesting contrasts uh, and also some interesting similarities that we'll dive into a bit tonight. But I think the first place I'd like to start is, and not everybody has to answer this question, but when we use the phrase digital media, how do you define that? When you think of it either, some of you are at firms that are focused on digital media, some of you, it's your function within a firm that has another purpose to it. Um, one piece of research I found said that um, in 1986, and I don't wanna know where any of our students were in 1986, because it will make me feel really old. Uh, in 1986, less than 1% of our information was available digitally, that we could actually access something uh, in a digital fashion. And in 2007, over 94% of information was available digitally. So when we talk about nothing has had the kind of disruptive effect, or few things have had the kind of disruptive effect 
that the digital transformation has had, when I saw those statistics, I was like, wow, that, and that is really in my professional lifetime uh, that I've seen that. So when you hear digital media, careers in digital media, digital media as a function or as a firm, how do you define it? And, and what are some of the, the hallmarks of digital media as you think of it? Erin? Okay. <laughs> I have digital media in my title, so I guess I should. And you are the expert. I can't, apparently. Um, it's much like love and data. <laughs> digital media is a much abused word, or it's a very nebulous word. Um, it, in my field, if you're in advertising, there's a big uh, break in the United States anyway between media agencies mm -hmm. and creative agencies. So when you say, I'm on the media side, that means I'm buying things. Mm -hmm. And that could be TV, billboards, digital. So when you say digital media as it relates to advertising, people think paid search, Google ads, YouTube, Facebook, mm -hmm. Amazon, anything that can be bought and it's often um, in real time, real time bidding, that's sort of the digital media world. Um, then you have digital media as in media that people consume. So that's social media, that's content creation, that's community managers, and that's uh, people that are developing media like you would project on a projector or watch on your phone. Um, and then there's the media companies, which are like NBC and CBS, and we mean news media as well as broadcast media. Um, so it's, it's any form, it's any channel that can be um, used to communicate with people. And so digital media is very, very varied. I think one of the things to look at is, okay, who am I talking to? Are they at a creative agency? They're gonna be making making stuff. They're gonna be making beautiful videos or um, pieces of content or focus on experience. Or am I talking to um, someone that um, has a lot of acronyms in their title and is uh, doing a lot of data analysis and analytics? Okay, that's gonna be media. Um, so yeah, I think that's the realm. I would love to hear if there's any other uh, thoughts, but it's really like big media companies that are making the media, social, and then advertising. Great, nice landscape. Any additions, corrections, challenges to, to that? I think the, the buy side, sell side paradigm fits w very well in kind of the way I think about it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the provider side, right? So I'm selling things that aren't physical assets, they're digital assets. And so we tend to think of digital media in that sense. Um, but then we have marketing teams internally that mm -hmm. think of digital media as things they buy to market our goods. So yeah. I think that buy, sell. You produce it, or you yeah, buy. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, I think, a good paradigm for it. Well, and we didn't purposely um, set this up as the sharks and the jets, but we've got, we definitely have media uh, agencies more represented on, on the right-hand side really? of the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, Javier, you kind of span both. You're, you're like the fulcrum. <laughs> we have a consultant in the middle, too. <laughs> right, exactly. But as you look at what you've seen in terms of digital media and careers in digital media, what are some of the the trends, what are some of the advantages, what are some of the draws for students in the room who either are searching for jobs or searching to transition into another job, what are some of the, the, the advantages and draws to working in digital media that you would want to emphasize from your perspective? I think it's one of the most creative um, outlets that there are. Um, I would say that anyone that has a, a track record and that builds up digital media experience can pretty much open a door to any company. There's a significant trend in the marketplace now of corporations building out digital teams internally. So a lot of the content creation, um, owned channel management, um, things that you see happening in the earned space is happening within companies now. So you have a lot of agency uh, folk that are moving and working within companies. Accenture has built out uh, the consulting practices. They've got pretty robust creative studios and are producing their own content. The likes of IBM have got enormous content studios with hundreds of content creators. So for me, like going into finance, doing strategy, some of the traditional kinds um, of business occupations, I think a career in digital media opens the door to pretty much any uh, sector that you're interested in these days. George? I'm going to take a whack at your first question and then hopefully back into the second one. As I've been sitting here thinking about your first question, I took, took, you know, go down the road, it took some time. <laughs> I, time. I think about for my own, for what I do, you know, when I look back when we're sending out memos and, you know, I wasn't in communication so much when we had to actually get things printed and, you know, handed to people. Often, 
But I was still in, com I was in communications when we were doing desk drops mm -hmm. to all 25,000 Lehman Brothers employees. Mm -hmm. I'm now in a situation where we need to think about you know, tweeting, we need to think about getting emails out quickly. Mm -hmm. But there's also levels of approval that we need to go through internally in order to get things done. And there's a lot of socialization at a larger institution that sometimes, again, when you're outside of the walls of your organization, at least in my instance, you know, I'm texting with friends, I'm not thinking about necessarily everything that I need to do when I'm inside in order to get something done. But the time my my connection to how I think about, you know, sharing information as well as consuming information, it's just so different and I need to st personally stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'd say, I mean, as you all think about it, if, if it's something that's still a question mark, it's exhilarating, it's ever-changing as you hear, and there are, different, there are different niches that you can get involved in. Mm -hmm. I mean, to come to a corp corporation like Bank of America, and we would love to have skills to, you know, we'd love to have more people with skills who can right. work within our construct and still get things done um, in the way that they need to in this day and age. Other thoughts? Rashan? So my not being from a, an agency or having come from a large organization that has a big communications department, one, one thing I'm constantly focused on is this idea of people's relationship with media mm -hmm. and as creators. So when you were talking about yourself sharing, and I think the best thing that anybody who's looking to take their communication practices that they're doing themselves uh, and then bring that into some organization is to be really reflective and kind of intentional about the ways that you're just naturally communicating these days as a creator. I mean, think about the last time you sent a screenshot to somebody just naturally, um, or the types of other messages, vi photos you're sh sending to fa family and friends or videos. You're just doing that by instinct, and then soon or later, that just becomes like a norm, and then organizations that are slower have to like respond because in order to communicate in a way that's natural to a broad audience, you have to shift strategy. So if you're able to like be articulate and get ahead of that, all of a sudden you can come in with a pretty good perspective and really be able to explain, hey, this is what's happening uh, and I'm living it, but I also know why it's working. And that's, I'm glad you brought that point up, Rashawn, because that's where I definitely feel there is a generational advantage to those who are stepping into organizations having been digital natives. You, you, you've, got a, you've got a shot on it. Uh, the rest of us may be you know, working for you someday soon. Uh, but the being able to, th to have always known it to be that immediate, the, the time issue, um, that bringing that into an organization where senior management is not clueless and they're not out of touch, but they don't instinctually consider how quickly things could happen, uh, you, you actually bring a whole skill set and a whole mindset that many of our more traditional organizations are catching up to or yet to evolve into. Yeah, and I'd like to kind of build on that. So part of what's happening is we have this culture of everything everywhere at once. And so the uh, sort of idea of a single use space is basically obsolete. So. Uh, many of our clients who are either retailers or hospitality clients or even some uh, corporate offices, the spaces now have to be designed for multiple uses throughout the time of day. And you know the lines between work and life are completely obliterated. I was going to say <laughs> blurred, right? So, so now, uh, as spaces are being designed, basically every space has to support you know, connecting with family members, doing a little bit of work, doing a little bit of discovery. Um, in fact, one of the things that um, is happening is that now what's most important is to create meaningful experiences. And so what our company uh, did is funded a research study called the Gensler Experience Index, which really meant to quantify, um, you know, what is it about a space that makes it useful? Like, why do people come to use a space? And there were five modes that we identified that people needed. So you're coming to a space to do a task, right? Like if you're going to the supermarket to buy some milk or you're going through um, security at an airport. Uh, other times you're going to connect and socialize with other people, or that you, maybe you're going to a bar with friends or you're going to meet at a you know, park bench and have a conversation. Other times you're really going to um, 
you know, sort of like um, be entertained. You kind of want to just sit back and, and be entertained. Um, the fourth one is you're maybe discovering like you have some time to kill. Like, you know, you're past security at the airport and now you can wander through or you're at a new place and you're kind of a new city and just kind of wandering around. And the fifth one is when you're really looking to grow as a person. So you're taking a yoga class or you're taking an extracurricular class at Columbia. So knowing those things, in whatever space you're designing, um, uh, you can actually work to activate those different modes of experience. And it's connected. The only reason this is possible, right, this is why it's interesting, I would say, so expanding the definition of digital media, it's really about information. And so we have information, whatever information we need now, we basically have it in our hands, wherever we are. So all of a sudden, you're free to do whatever you want wherever. Um, and then you can have, uh, again, for our clients, how do we design those spaces so that people can, are really wanting to come to those spaces because it allows them to do whatever they want to do. And, and really um, empowering users with a greater sense of choice, right. a greater sense of information at our fingertips, a greater sense of, of choice about how to spend my time or what to do in this space that we've never had before in that regard. Right. I, I love your focus, Javier, on on the experience. Years ago, we used to say high tech, high touch. Mm -hmm. The more high tech everything became, right. the more important those one-on-one -on -one conversations became. Uh, the more important the, the experience in Starbucks became because we were spending so much of our time on our phone, on our laptop. And, and, and you're, you're speaking to that beautifully in terms of architecture design. Mm -hmm. Are there any other examples from the industries that the rest of you represent where you're seeing a heightened focus on experience or interpersonal connection because we're so digitally connected? So a lot of what we do is, um, at, at the most basic level, sell Keynote or PowerPoint templates, right? And if, if you think about it as a digital asset, um, it kind of seems mundane, but it, it's a primary work, work tool. I'm sure it's installed on everybody's desktop, right? I'm sure you've all used it today. Many right? of our In phones. one form, Google <laughs> Docs, right? Or, or more than you. And it's because we're telling stories, right? So as, bu as business leaders or employees, we're telling stories, trying to convey information. And um, the ability today to have digital assets that let us tell those stories in more powerful and more visual ways is really, for, from my perspective, transformative. Because that used to be something that was reserved for um, the elite within an organization, right? The people who could afford you know, the $300 an hour designers or something who are going to build right. these you know, $10,000 decks. But, but that has changed. And, and in many organizations, it's not changed for the good, right? It's just changed so we have lots of noise and PowerPoint slide behind me saying the exact same points that I'm telling you right now, right? And that's not a good example of it. But when it's used in the right way to convey a story, um, it becomes a very powerful and transformative. And it, it also puts that along with other digital a assets like the social media stuff. I mean, I come from a relatively small organization, and the tools that this puts in our hands to succeed used to only be available to large organizations, right? And so for entrepreneurs, it empowers you yeah. in a way that's, um, that's very different than 10 years ago or 20 years or five ago, years ago, or 30 years ago, <laughs> when I started my career. Um, I have Aaron? kind of an interesting uh, POV on that one. Broadway's a unique space uh, when it comes to digital, because so often you're told to turn your phones off, and uh, being digitally connected is a bad thing in the theater. Um, and it's one thing that the industry grapples with, because social sharing, people are proud to snap a photo of their playbill and take a, a, pic a picture with a proscenium, and we love that when we're trying to sell tickets. So it's become this sort of, um, it, 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 it both expands the realm of po possibilities of reaching more people. It enhances the experience when people are there. They can go read the cast bios. Um, there's even, um, in, in, a, in the world of accessibility, um, if you put a box in front of your phone that we are, there's not too much light, they're translating, there's programs or apps you can download to translate exactly what's happening on stage in foreign languages or for the hearing impaired. So technology is a huge um, enhancement of the experience, but there's also the factor of responsible use of technology in the arts, because there's always that person trying to trying to film <laughs> the, whole thing. the whole thing or take pictures or their, their phone is buzzing or you hear the click, 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 
as they text, you know? Yeah. So um, we have a love-hate relationship with it in the theater because the theater is a sacred space. And yet, as a digital marketer, I'm like, please, Instagram everything, Sh- share the stories. <laughs> <laughs> Patty Lapone had a really interesting experience Infamous. when somebody was filming uh, the end of one of her numbers. Stop the but, show. Uh, but that also translates right back into the business environment, right? I mean, I'm sure you all see yeah. in your own businesses, right, that in, in the conference room, yeah. that exact same mm-hmm. thing happens, right? There's a huge advantage mm-hmm. to having access to technology in a business meeting. Mm-hmm. But how many times are you in a business meeting where you're sure that no one's actually paying attention, attention yeah. right? Because everyone's doing something, something else. else. Now, that, of course, never happens in our classes here right? at Columbia because <laughs> our students are never on their technology. He's watching State of the Union over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, other, other thoughts on advantages, new horizons, new things that we see because of, of digital media being available to us? Well, I, I think in terms of, you know, Aaron's world is one of probably pretty extreme personalization. And so in retail, mm-hmm. there's actually, people say there's a um, $3 trillion prize for the retailers that can figure out, uh, you know, precise personal customization in the retail space, right? So that's coming, right? So right now, if you go on a website, they're feeding you maybe some, you know, you, we knew you bought this last time, so we're going to show you these other products. So what is that going to look like now if you walk into a retail space and there's like things are presented to you that are that are personalized? Yeah, it drives me crazy when I walk into Walgreens and my phone beeps and I get a text <laughs> right. saying, by the way, hair cream is on sale in aisle three. I'm like, I don't even want you to know that I'm in aisle three. And so there, there can be a, a big brother uh, sort of experience right. of, of digital media being too into our world. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I had coffee this afternoon with Matt Sawyer, one of uh, the other uh, faculty members in strategic communication. And uh, he gave me a, an interesting idea. Um, I just put into the New York Times the phrase digital media. And let us see what it brings us as headlines that is the job market that this group is looking at. Digital media, what went wrong? Digital media (laughs) company, BuzzFeed, cutting 15% of jobs. Mm -hmm. The future of print journalism in the age of digital media. Unions are gaining a foothold at digital media companies. Why are the latest layoffs devastating to our democracy? Your kid's phone is like a cigarette. Okay, so um, <laughs> there's a lot of negative publicity and yeah. media this week, this month, uh, just even this year around digital media. And that's the environment that our graduates are gonna be stepping into. What do they need to be aware of? What do they need to be thoughtful of as they approach careers inside either, again, a firm that's focused on digital media or a function of digital media in a larger firm? What are the risks? I think, go ahead. No, go ahead, you go first, please. I really think it depends on what kind of company you're going into, because startups are exciting. They're also pretty dangerous. You don't know if they're gonna work out. They may be responding to a particular trend that tends, uh, that may not end up having a long tail. So you could get involved in something that doesn't work out very, very quickly. You could, uh, for me, um, I would look at organizations that have got a a lot of different departments, qual and quant driven digital opportunities for you. I was chatting to some folk before we sat down to speak and I think that one of the most sought after attributes in digital professionals today is the ability to understand data, what's good data, what's bad data, um, what's actionable um, and really insightful as a result of that data, and then able to translate that to something that's really compelling from a storytelling standpoint and enables you to broker a relationship and a customer in a completely new way. So I would look for organizations that give you a little bit of flexibility. You may surprise yourself and think that you're going in for a quant type field and discover that you really love the qualitative component and you want to take the data, use it creatively and tell a very different kind of story. And conversely, you may go in um, with a a qual type uh, mindset and really be interested in human behavior, but get really frustrated. And I've seen this um, with people in my teams over the years and say, you know, I'm I'm doing all of these things, but I really just want to understand what behavior I shift in the end. So I want to get into like the meat of the data and understand what sales I'm driving at the end of the day. Otherwise it's pie in the sky and I don't know that it's doing anything and it's not satisfying to me. So I would give myself an opportunity if I was going into the market for the first time to speak to as many people that you as you can intern 
turn in as many places as you can and give yourself room to explore the quant side and the qual side because they're both really magical and there's a tremendous amount of creativity mm. in both areas. Um, just because, and if you speak to Aaron, um, when you get into the detailed side of the data and you know what you're looking at, there is such magic that can be created there and nice. every employer everywhere wants to know that they're getting return on investment. So I, I would flex. Nice. Nice. Other thoughts? A lot of agreement from your colleagues that Yeah, down I, the I think any, if you're able to articulate both kind of a perspective and then your ideas for either addressing or enhancing whatever the current challenge is, but ultimately being able to describe how that would be measured, that's mm -hmm. what's very attractive in a land of unknowns, that there's just an idea. So when you're coming in, it's not only do I, can I describe what's happening or describe a problem or articulate what's working well, but here is how I would measure it and what I would want to be measured against. Um, that would impress me. Um, I think, uh, total agreement. Um, I also think there's an exploding world of marketing technology uh, and advanced analytics that is booming. Um, automation. And we do have a number of our applied analytics students who are here tonight, so. Awesome, you guys chose great great fields. Um, the supply and demand curve is outrageous right now. Um, at Sereno Coin, and we were a smaller arts agency, um, and we were inherently a little more creative. I was on the analytics and the paid search side, so um, I remember getting there, and there were so many creatives and, and not enough analytical rigor in the organization that I sort of started that group there. And then when we would put out job applications for um, analyst or uh, analytics lead, we would get four applications, maybe seven, and the content and community and the account management roles, hundreds. Everyone wanted to work in those fields. So I think there's a limiting belief that data science and analytics is really hard. And again, I thought I wanted to be an actress. I thought <laughs> I wanted to be a singer. And now I do paid search and analytics. So don't limit yourself. Don't let those words nice. scare you. They're surprisingly, um, a lot of the machines and the, and the macros <laughs> do a lot of the work for you. And again, it's the art of finding something interesting. You see a breadcrumb. Hmm, that's interesting in my Google campaign. You check it in your Facebook campaign, that same breadcrumb is there. Those machines don't fit very well together. They don't integrate very well together. It, it, you, it's about knowing those types of data sets and being able to infer those patterns and extrapolate them out. Um, and so when you have a sort of a creative brain, don't let any fear of math, especially the ladies in the room, because in America, we tend to shy away from math and quantitative uh, aspects. Um, I, I would say that the supply and demand is on your side. And also, don't just apply to agencies or consulting firms. A lot of brands are in housing this. Yeah. Excellent. Other well, thoughts? Huh? I would take it a little further. That's all really great in terms of when you really think about the future. Yeah. Um, I forget the exact statistic, but there's more than a billion people are going to be added to cities before 2030. And so um, the future of our world is really going to be in, in smart cities. And so what does that mean? Uh, smart cities and smart buildings that are um, uh, sort of evolved through artificial technology and the Internet of Things. So when you think about digital media, right? I like the statistic you had about, you know, in the 1980s, how much was digital and how much is now. And that's just going to continue to explode in terms of the noise of information that we're bombarded with on a constant basis, walking through Walgreens. and you get. So what's going to happen? So, and you can already start to see it. So people will become uh, hungrier for real personal connections and tangible things, so like what Rashad is talking about. And so then it's really about how do we use digital media to actually encourage uh, and uh, meaningful human connections, you know, whether it's uh, connecting people in a yep. building, connecting people in school, allowing you more free time to spend off your devices uh, with your friends. Um, that's really the, the forefront. Yeah. yeah, there is a counter movement at the moment of people like right. actively putting their screens down. Mm -hmm. But I would say at the end of the day, uh, we're speaking to people and you're just accessing them through a different mechanism. Right. So for me, the, the things that you will always have to be able to do is to find the human truth, really, really understand from a data standpoint how to connect with the person that you're connecting with, mm -hmm. come up with a really, really compelling story that enables you to grab their attention in an age of content pollution because you're not just competing against competitors in your industry, you're competing against the best piece That's of right. content that that person has received from any brand on every platform that they use at that moment in time every day. So you really are competing against everything that is out there. And if you're able to zero in on that behavior, find something compelling and tell a story that really blows their hair back, 
you're in. That's the whole value of the session right there. Yeah. Yeah. One sentence. <laughs> Can you say the sentence one more time <laughs> for the students who are taking notes? I would say that at the end of the day, we're just speaking to people and the ability to break through is your ability to find a simple human truth, understand their behavior, and come up with a really compelling creative idea or nice. a story that engages them, because yep. that's what we're doing. Whether it's, I was talking to a creative director this morning, and we were saying the difference between marketing now and marketing 20 years ago is we'd be having debates about how to tell the most compelling um, story in 90 seconds. And now we're having conversations to say, okay, now I have this long form content, how do I make sure that that platform is as engaging in six seconds as it is in 90 or 60? Right. And you have, to, you have to be so much sharper in your insights and so much sharper in the ideas and really, um, I think, powerfully simple, as reductive as you can be because you, you, we're looking at this, like what's gonna be thumb stopping in a moment in time. Got it, yeah. got it. And it's art and science, you, you gotta have Absolutely. both. Absolutely. And I, I Absolutely. love that we're hearing, we're hearing the phrases, like what's resonating for me as I listen to this conversation is art and magic and science and also uh, noise. And you, uh, you had a phrase for it a moment ago, um, congestion. Content, content pollution. Content pollution. Yeah, yeah. Um, that we really are defining this, this landscape, this career field that many of you are looking at in, in very powerful terminology as we look at that. Stephen? There's a dark side to all of this too. Like, I, I mean, as I as I listen with my consumer hat on for a second, right? <laughs> Forget about what I do. I'm like, I'm like, wow. I, how many trillion dollars did you say prize for three trillion for for understanding and and mm -hmm. getting? I mean, all of this, our engagement with digital media, both social and non, mm -hmm. just constantly begs us to give up more and more information about ourselves, right? And so yeah. I don't think as, as industry, I don't think we've really grappled with the privacy issues in a way that many of you will have to grapple with as you go out. And, and I, so I think that's just an interesting, I know that's not the topic here today necessarily, but I think kind of privacy and the ethics around this will be something that um, as, as this continues to evolve is gonna become bigger and bigger on it's massive. There are um, a number of uh, bodies internationally that have established ethics committees on yeah. when and how you can use data. There's a study that's out that I would encourage you all to have a look at. It's done by the University of South Carolina at Annenberg, and it's called the Digital Futures Project. What's really exciting about the study is that they've been tracking. Um, they work as part, uh, work in, part in, uh, in partnership with the World Internet Organization, and they've been tracking the impact of digital media on Americans, Americans and their behavior of the last 16 years. They've taken a robust sample size that's reflective of the US population and they've engaged with individual families. They've tried to speak to the same people over and over, but if they don't get traction with the family over time, they continue to find a similar mm -hmm. type of family. And it is fascinating to see um, this push and pull about the light and the dark side. My desire, like I simultaneously want to connect and unplug at the same time. <laughs> I want to surrender my information because I want a seamless experience, but I also want to retain control yeah. so that um, I know that my data is not being used right. um, in an unethical manner. Um, I am open to innovation. With, like The stats that blew me away, um, especially amongst millennials, is that 27% of millennials, if it was safe and there were no adverse effects, would be comfortable implanting technology into their hands so that they never had to use passwords, they could just mm -hmm. access their bank accounts without engaging in anything, would automatically sign onto their computers, wouldn't have to use their driver's licenses or passports or those kinds of things. 40% um, of the same crowd, if they dialed today, if they um, used an app to get an Uber or a Lyft and a driverless car showed up, would get in the car without ever having um, been in that kind of environment before without any proof that it was totally safe to do so. Wow. So there's a willingness um, to push the forefront of innovation and to really lean into that kind of technology, but at the same time, this need to really retain control and to make sure that whatever it is that you're using um, is something that's going to be relevant to you. And we are seeing a drop in the number of early adopters with new technology. There is a slowdown, we're kind of checking it out first. We wanna make sure that it's actually meaningful, it's relevant, it's gonna do the things that you're saying it's gonna do for me. So as, as much as we're leaning forward, we're also leaning back. So and it's a really interesting time. It's interesting as you describe that, Carla, and I'm looking back at the title um, behind <laughs> you, that push me, pull you mentality hits at the individual level, 
at the organization or the firm level and absolutely at the society level because we can see amazing opportunities and yet the dark side uh, that comes with that. And then George? Also, and then for us, we, I, mean, I think about government, I think about regulation, which comes on the heels. And again, being in, a, in an institution that uh, had regulation, you know, hitting it f uh, for a while now, it's fascinating to see how the likes of, you know, Zuckerberg on the Hill and having conversations and the implications of regulation, which typically lags. And unfortunately, then there's this odd, odd play of catch, trying to catch up, right. if you will, to and un frankly, even understand. And that's the uh, you know there are a lot of terms and <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. ways of operating that uh, where education is needed in order to really bring you know yeah. what would be good ideally through it all. So I'm I'm going to pose one final question to the panel and then go to the audience here. Um, I apologize. I don't know the answer to this question. Do we have a way? that people on the live stream are also asking us questions? Matt or Barbara, do either of you know? Is there a way for live streamers to pose questions? Give them your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can text me at 917-55, no. Uh, I don't think we do. I think it's just the, the, the guests who are in the room here. Uh, and so in a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll go to those questions. But, but the last piece I want to ask is a little bit tangent to where we're at, but I've got six of you from very different sized organizations. Um, Rashawn and Steven, you both right now are in startups that, that are relatively small. Uh, Javier, you were in a very small firm for many years and now you're in a very large firm. Uh, George, you, you've been in, in very large financial services firms and, and now at Bain. Uh, Carly, you've had experience all across. As you think of stepping into a career what, for the students in the audience, what are some of the advantages of being, say, in a startup, Steve or Rashawn, or, or in a large firm, some of the rest of you? What are some of the pros and cons as you think of uh, the size of an organization to join? And it can be tied to digital media, or it can just be tied to your experience in careers. Thoughts on that? Rashawn, you want to start us? Sure. So I think from the perspective of a startup, I think you get to see the impact of your work a lot more quickly um, than you might in other organizations. And that's not necessarily because of the speed of impact, but just because of process or, or distance or proximity to where you are versus where that impact might be taking place. Uh, I think that proximity aspect is certainly uh, a big part of it. Uh, and I also think that you know, there is that kind of scrappy mentality of, of being in a startup. So you might have you know, a role or a title, but you actually do get to kind of nurture your other curiosities and interests because uh, not just because it's possible, but because it's probably necessary that you have to chip in and contribute your intellectual capital to many areas of the business. Um, so just as a learning opportunity, I think, it, I think it's tremendous. Other re re reactions or thoughts? I mean, I've, I've worked in, in kind of both extremes. I've worked in very small startups and very large organizations like IBM. And I think that um, in the large organizations, I learned really good skills uh, uh, on communication and presentation and how to kind of navigate politics and how to sell and, and things that I wouldn't have learned other places. In the smaller organizations, I've learned what actually makes business successful because you see, you're able to see the connections mm -hmm. between the data and the campaigns and the sales team and all these things in a way you just don't get to see in a big. So they, they offer very different things. And I, you know, I started in large firms and went to small. And to me, I feel like I got a great foundation by being in those large firms that I would have never had otherwise. Um, I suspect that's not what Rashawn's done. <laughs> He's gone right into the small. And, but, just but stay I, small. But I think that you, know, you, I think you carve out your own niche, but they, they offer very different things, for sure. I think that there's different levels of agility in different companies. In a small company, I would agree with all the things that you've said, having been in that space before, is that you move very quickly. You have a flatter decision-making structure, so you, you tend to get stuff done a lot faster, and that can be very satisfying. But at the same time, there are often budget constraints, which comes with advantages too, because it teaches you to be a lot more creative with what you're doing and to really get maximum impact for the budget that you have. At the same time, you may not have um, structure in and around you that uh, affords you 
um, sort of some practical on the job training. You may not have the time for mentorship, that kind of thing, which you would necessarily get in a, a big organization. In big organizations, though, and as far as working with big budgets and being able to do things, especially if you're doing things that have a social good component, which um, I've, is something I've tried to seek out in, in all of the organizations that I've worked for, you get to see the impact at scale. So you understand in a much more meaningful um, way whether you're, you're making an impact in your environment, your organization, how your messages get getting through and you play with larger budgets. I would say though that irrespective of, where, of what size company you choose, find a culture that really aligns to your personality and your way of working. You can thrive and have a fantastic, happy, rich, fulfilling career in a really bigger organization and you can do exactly the same thing in a mid-size or a small organization as long as you find a company whose value system, whose ways of working, um, whose focus and, and clients that they serve or the particular things that they're doing really resonate with you as a person. And to that, I would add that that's why I would encourage everyone to try as many things as possible. So having internships, interview people and ask them about their career experience and really kind of follow what's going to like motivate you because it could be a small firm or a very large firm. Yeah. And I want to jump off that both uh, Carla and Javier have mentioned the value of internships. Many of you are pursuing degrees as working professionals. And that does not mean that you cannot do an internship. Mm -hmm. You have to be a bit more creative about it. You have to look at, at what sorts of opportunities you can carve out and create inside of the organizations that you want to be at. But I've had several students who have been able to create something either in a volunteer capacity, in a summer break capacity, uh, in a one day a week, being able to leave the firm that they're employed at and be at a, a firm that is distinctly different. And many of our employers today are actually, in terms of work-life balance and wanting to cater to the millennials and Generation X and Z, are creating more flexible work environments that allow you to get that other experience. But you have to, you have, to have some ownership in that. You have to have some agency in that to create what you want. Absolutely. Other thoughts, large versus small culture thoughts before we go to the studio audience? Go, go. Yeah, yeah. I'll add one quick thing. Um, idea stolen from the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Um, yeah, if you want to enter a field, find the professional organization that those professionals gather for and then volunteer your time. Like even with this event, you know, to your point, like somebody needs to print the, lay, the name tag, somebody needs to stay, stick around to help clean up because then you're actually like getting to meet the people who are, you want to meet in a, an environment that um, you know, kind of fosters a better connection. Excellent. Yeah. George? I totally echo the culture point. <laughs> and not only the organization, but in, as you can, as I'm sure you all know, try to talk to as many of the people that you'll be working with immediately because there can be many cultures within a larger organization yeah. Uh, yeah. that I see on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the one thing I've, one of the many things I've learned working in large organizations, uh, it's, it's process and sometimes in the, well, I'll call it more creative fields, it's, you know, you bring passion to what you do, but it's also, I appreciate what I've been a part of to really see how things move through a large organization and get done. And it's fascinating to, mm -hmm. you know, experience the, the interconnectedness across the company. And th mm -hmm. there are also many things that are done that you'd be surprised at in large organizations, which I can get into. Um, and, you know, Over you know, drinks. I exactly. <laughs> also encourage folks to go um, work in consulting firms, work in agencies, work in uh, large corporations, because you'll understand the business of marketing and digital media from completely different points of view and it makes you a very valuable asset. It makes you a better um, agency partner if you've been on the client side. It makes you a more understanding and appreciative <laughs> client. You understand the quality control um, oh, components and what your agency is doing and the difference between a good idea and a great idea. Um, and you're able to, to motivate for that in a different way. So I do think that it, gives, it makes you a valuable partner if you have exposure to different things. Excellent, excellent. So with that, I am now going to turn things over to the audience, uh, and I would just ask as you come forward, if you have a question, come to the mic so that we can all hear you. Uh, let us know your name, if you're a student, what degree program you're in, if you're an alum uh, and, and did one of the SPS degrees, let us know where you're coming from, uh, and who has questions you'd like to ask. Yeah, go ahead, just uh, line up there. 
Not everyone at once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's on. Well, but for the live stream, let the, just somebody's coming up. Let me make sure it's on, and then we'll let you go. For my parents that are on the live stream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's true. Is that good? Should all win. <laughs> Great. So my name is Knut, and I'm an applied analytics student here. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to ask you about is the concept of clickbait. Um, I have, I don't really know the term content pollution, it might touch up on that, which Carla was talking about earlier, I'm not really familiar with that term, but I really found that clickbait has become a quite uh, a huge component of digital media today. For mm -hmm. example, looking back at some of the newspapers I used to read uh, a few years ago, they didn't have the same degree of clickbait that they do today. Today, some of the newspapers that I used to read have about 30% of, you know, watch this viral video and they just pulled it down on YouTube basically and said, hey, look at this. And on one side you have um, the component of the newspapers, for example, uh, wanting to secure their bottom line and this might be helping them. On the other hand, the mission of a newspaper should probably be informing rather than entertaining in my opinion. So I'd love to hear your, your take on that and maybe talk a bit about you know, the state of that and maybe how it's going to be going for forward. Thoughts about clickbait? I have a thought on that. <laughs> <laughs> really? How much time do we have? Um, excellent question. Um, I think this is sort of where we're getting at with the art and the science argument, uh, where sometimes we miss the forest through the trees. We're so focused on click-through rates and web hits and sessions, um, and it's about the volume of traffic that we miss the societal impact that clickbait has. Um, native ad networks have started. Uh, there's always these top 10 articles that are sort of marketing to the lowest common denominator as opposed to really elevating the truth. Um, the New York Times actually just put out a campaign. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it's the truth is hard. Um, Google that when you get home, but it was all about how um, the truth is, it's not about clickbait, it's about rigorous journalism and photojournalism in this case. Um, and that struck an emotional chord. That is, that is a campaign that really blew my hair back um, <laughs> and really made an impression. Um, but I think that's where if we focus too much on the data side and we negate the societal side and we negate the art and the purpose, we end up in a yellow journalism-esque world. And in some ways, 24-hour news cycles, it's not just digital, it's also just our culture of um, news overload that mm -hmm. we're sort of creating, um, if it bleeds, it leads, yellow journalism and, you know, that started the Spanish-American War. <laughs> we have to be very careful about, about um, what we do to get a click versus what's better for society. And I think what could help that is more subscription models and, and potentially, um, you know, I, I always believe in, in uh, church and state, so I don't think the government should be regulating the press in any way. Um, but there, there, do, there does need to be um, the financial pressures to get the traffic are too hard. That, that's what these organizations have been resorted, have had to resort to. So I think if we want good authoritative news, we need to be willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, thanks for that question, one of the uh, bright spots that I saw in doing the research for this panel, one of the articles I read said um, two of the bright spots about digital media. One is the, the increased growth of subscription models, particularly to traditional uh, news organizations. So it's interesting to have this conversation inside of the Pulitzer Building with a strong journalism tradition at Columbia. Uh, that many, many people over the last couple of years in particular have gone back to paying for uh, the news that they really value and the huge growth of the podcast movement. Mm -hmm. That, you know, and when, when I look at my podcast feeds, I, I have a couple that are five or 10 minutes, but the ones I really cherish are an hour or longer mm -hmm. and I will dedicate that time in my commute, in my workout, other places. And those were two kind of bright spots of this whole clickbait mentality. So thanks. I just, can I just pick up on that from a business perspective also because I, I think you, you made an important point about the data is not always the right answer. And I just think kind of going back to the conversation we had before, it is the data you're getting is about social media and all these things is one thing you need to one consider difference. in your decision right, yeah. making in a business. It's not yeah. the answer, right? And I think yeah. we tend to get caught up in it and think, 
it is the answer. And in fact, just like it's not socially the answer, it's also not a business. It's an input mm -hmm. to, to making good decisions. Good. Yep. good thought. Thanks. Next question, please. Sam. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Applied Analytics program. And uh, we both listen to uh, West Wing Weekly. Go West Wing Weekly. Yes. Great podcast. <laughs> Uh, so you, uh, Aaron was touching on this before in the last uh, answer, but uh, with digital media pr platforms um, really increase the speed and access to news, um, almost to the point where it's overcome accuracy. Um, what is being done to combat disinformation in actual fake news? So. I just spoke, so I feel like I should. <laughs> Go for it, expert. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, this is the gray area of free speech and social networks being platforms and not publishers uh, versus, um, versus actual, actually removing content or blocking content that is profane, obscene, or inaccurate. Um, the challenge is, Everyone has a voice, so that creates a lot of noise. And um, I, I think I was watching like the last week tonight about this, about the number of content moderators that, that Facebook had um, in Malaysia. Did anyone see that? And it was like, you know, one person. And then they you know, doubled it to two, and then doubled that to four. But that with the amount of volume that's being, that's being uh, produced, um, the onus of, of regulating that content is, is strong and then also creating very strict guidelines on what is allowed versus what is silencing free speech. Um, so this is an area where I feel um, some regulation would be helpful as opposed to letting companies decide what they're going to allow versus what they're not going to allow. Um, and then also the paid platforms, I remember working in Angels in America, we uh, had an MSNBC piece, um, an interview, um, with, uh, with Andrew Garfield, and it got blocked. We couldn't promote it, because it was MSNBC was the link out, and because it was going to a news site, there's more layers of scrutiny to get your ad approved. And this had no political, this was just an interview with the cast of Angels in America on Broadway. And I was sort of horrified, because I was like, this is art, you know, this, is, this shouldn't be screened. But then I was relieved, because it does, it is a, a human oversight and a human filter. Um, it starts automated and then it, you have to mm -hmm. reply and say, no, this is real, and then a human actually reviews it. Um, but I would have rather jumped through those hoops and had to wait 24 hours to post it than someone saying the Holocaust didn't Anything happen. goes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, is there any career opportunity that's available now because of this speed versus accuracy uh, dilemma that we find ourselves in? that students in the room might want to have their eyes and ears open for? Is, is there, while there's the challenge, is there an opportunity inside of that that we should be thinking through? Well, I think one thing to think about uh, in terms of, you know, controlling volume is, um, and this is applies to every industry, but it really is artificial intelligence and developing better ways for machines to be able to determine what's true and what's not true. It's yeah. a very difficult problem. Lots of opportunity there for somebody mm -hmm. to like work on solving that problem. Because often it's keywords, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Stephen, well, you see, I mean, you see a lot of companies like YouTube comes to mind right now, right? I mean, there's a lot of with um, people doing stupid things blindfolded, right? They've they've started to take those videos down and not allow them to be posted. And so I think you start to see um, on the ethics side, there's a lot of people grappling with those with those sorts of issues. And so I think, you know, I don't know specifically where in the organizations, I don't know if others know where, where those groups sit. I think a lot of it's probably on the legal side, right? Yeah, um, risk. But, but uh, you, you do see large organizations starting George to take knows. stands. George, <laughs> George, I start chuckling because as I listen to you, I think about compliance and risk yeah. at a large, you know, financial services institution. They exist because, no, not just because, I, Internet. <laughs> I don't but one of the reasons they exist is due to the regulation and due to the need to have those checks and balances, if you will, in place. So it's it's fascinating as I listen to this conversation and almost wonder whether you know there's there's some outgrowth, if you will, of a form of compliance and risk that will kind of be 
circling this uh, this area in the in the near future. Not that it isn't, but in a really specific form that mirrors you know what's seen in other organizations. And, and I think of our our students in the enterprise risk management degree. Um, when that program was founded 10 years ago, 12 years ago, like how much of that field has really shifted and probably will continue to shift. Next question, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Shipali. I'm from Applied Analytics um, course. Uh, so I have a very simple question. So we have discussed a lot. It was a very enriching discussion. Uh, I, my question is, what is one key piece of advice that you, student, that you want students to take away from this discussion, especially uh, in the impact of media on organizations? So, okay. Yeah. So one key piece of advice you, you would want students to take away um, from this discussion. I can cold call. I am a professor. <laughs> I have that power. <laughs> I think for me, so so I'm in my early 50s, right? And you guys are, not all of you, but lots not. of you are much younger. <laughs> um, and I think for me, I look at, at you and think, wow, you guys are going to have to grapple with this in a way that, that my generation hasn't had to, right? And the, the issues, the societal issues um, that are going to manifest from social media and digital media and all that is going to be much more impactful. And I think you guys are going to have to grapple with um, the issues that that uncovers in, in ways that we, we can't even imagine today. And I think from a career perspective, then that, op that opens the door for, for careers none of us here could even imagine today. I, I think for me it would be um, we're at a little bit of a tipping point uh, when it comes to automation, machine learning, and AI. Um, that is going to be a game changer. Uh, McKinsey is projecting and. 20 years or something as much as 40% reduction in jobs that currently exist, that currently exist. There will be probably a whole realm of jobs that exist that are to correctly calibrate machines and make sure they don't misfire. Um, so we don't really know what that's going to do yet, but the mundane tasks or the data processing tasks are going to be handled by machines. So I think embrace for change and try to think of skill sets you can develop that are about understanding how different technological pieces come together um, and understanding um, how to empower automation because automation is a tool and it's only as good as the people as how you wield it um, and I think if you can just um, embrace for change and embrace that automation is going to really um, create opportunities and careers that you didn't that don't exist now that we can't imagine will exist in 10 15 years Carla? I would say look for problems that haven't been solved yet and start thinking about how to solve them. A lot of the hires that I've seen made in companies are folk that have leveraged digital media to find like-minded folk to tackle problems that other people are grappling with and come up with a hypothesis of how to solve them. And in the context of doing that, you're demonstrating how you think and what you bring as a person that's different from anybody else. Um, there is a world of opportunity. And um, like many of the panelists have said, I think it's pretty limitless. So if there isn't a job that fits the criteria that you have, if you're dreaming of something or imagining something that doesn't exist, leverage. Uh, leverage the internet, leverage social media. Uh, someone somewhere is thinking about the same thing that, mm. as you are, and you could potentially develop a collective to solve a problem and introduce uh, an approach to a company and, and create a job for yourselves. And I do see a lot of that happening in companies today, folk coming up to you and saying, listen, I see that you do this, but you're not doing this in this particular way. I'd love to be able mm -hmm. to do X for you. And it opens the door to a conversation that might otherwise not have happened. I really like the way you said that, Carla, to create uh, the job opportunity that you want for yourself, even if it's not posted, and even if it doesn't exist. Um, we were very intentional here at School of Professional Studies to create, first in New York and now in San Francisco, the Career Design Lab. And my colleague Michael Alvarez uh, and I talk often about this, that we are not a placement office. The idea of placing you into a career, mm -hmm. placing you into IBM or Bank of America or, or uh, GE that you are going to spend the rest of your, of your professional lives, that's not how career services works anymore. And, and really the concept of Career Design Lab is to have you have the tools, the resources, the insights 
that you then create what you want to step into. And, and every so, business has problems. If you, you go and look at their social media, look at their own like, own channels, look at the things that are happening and look for solutions to those problems because internally they're grappling with those same problems and trying to, to facilitate solutions. Yeah. And if you can be the applicant that shows up with a solution mm -hmm. to a problem that a firm has really been grappling with, you're adding value before you have even yet been hired. Exactly. So, And, and one sort of access to that, I just want to kind of add to it, Carla and Steve and Aaron were saying and the rest of the panel is in this sort of increasingly changing world which is only going to change even more quickly and more uh, broadly focus on the sort of timeless universal truths of being human that's mm -hmm. actually not going to change so what's going to happen is there's going to be more there's always going to be an interest of having human connection of being known of feeling safe or feeling fulfilled so in the industries that you're interested in, look at ways that you can help those companies, help their audiences have better human experiences. So nice. Yeah. This, um, this unfortunately mirrors a little bit what I told you the final question on, would be to the panel. Um, so I'm still gonna go with my final question. I'm still starting with Rashan. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust it a little bit in that uh, what I'd ask them to be prepared for is it's, it's a real privilege for us to be able to be with you this evening and to have the chance to offer our thoughts, our insights, our advice uh, to people who are younger and at an earlier point in their career. What I'd love to have you answer is, she had said, you know, based on what you said tonight about digital media, I want you to answer outside of the realm of digital media. If you could go back and talk to your 24, 26, 28 year old self, what is the advice you would want to go back and share with that individual as they're looking forward at their career? What's the tip, what's the, the nugget that you wish somebody would have told you when you were at the point our students are? Rashawn? So I'll put my my, my, my graduate school faculty hat on. And I think that, you know, for most of you who are in degree programs right now, I think something I wish I'd heard earlier, I heard it too late, was whatever you're doing while you're in this amazing network of people and network of faculty and interesting learning experiences is to be really purposeful in connecting those things to where you want to be when you finish this program, right? Like you've you made a choice to pursue a degree and it's bounded by time, right? Hopefully you'll graduate within the appropriate amount of time. But then it comes to an end. <laughs> um, and hopefully it's not just about like, oh, I took some courses and now I've got a nice Columbia credential uh, because there's so much else that's part of the experience and being fully present and aware of that while you're in it uh, I heard that too late. Right. George? You know, I, uh, I, sh I, sh I shared my idea a little earlier. I'm going I'm to expound on it a little bit because I've been thinking. So all of you are going to an, an institution that ge that's allowed you to flex your you know, creativity, gives you analytical rigor. Remember, you know, falling back on that when you're out in the world, there's so many opportunities that um, are available to you. And it's easy to either feel sometimes overwhelmed or at lost once you get out of, you know, the, the uh, institution, if you will, that you go through. And I think many of you had uh, work experience, so, you know, you, you get a sense of what's out there. But it's, you know, I talk to colleagues regularly about how challenging it is to find smart people who get it. So there's the what aspect, then there's also the how too. So being able to you know, connect with people, relate, and you know, through you know, digital media or whatever the platform, tell your stories as we talked about as well, that really matters. And even down to the small things. I mean, I'm, I still, I keep the little thank you cards that I get because they're few and far between these days, but not so, I mean, after interviews, yeah, but I, when people do meaningful things for you, reach out, keep that connection, because many of the opportunities that I've had throughout my career are due to connections that I've made throughout my career. Uh, frankly, I'm at Lehman Brothers. 
the woman who was a woman in HR who I, whom I kept in touch with through LinkedIn. She tapped me on the shoulder. That's the reason I'm at Bank of America years later. I'm still in touch with her. Now she's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Goldman Sachs. So she's kind of contact I definitely want to keep. <laughs> <laughs> Javier? Um, just building on what um, has been said, I think I would say live in the moment. Don't worry so much. Mm. Be comfortable in the uncertainty and being in the inquiry um, because th what will come will probably be unexpected and surprising. Nice. Thank you. Erin? Uh, mine would probably be don't limit yourself. Don't define what you want to do now because there's so much you don't even know that's out there. Um, you know, I, I beat myself up about turning my back on Broadway and getting a real advertising job. And I really thought, you know, in high school that I was going to sing and have this life because that's what I did in high school. And then I got into the real world and I realized I really didn't like it. And I beat myself mm. up and I thought I was a quitter and I'm like quitting on my dreams. But I actually much, I was good at digital media and I really enjoyed it. So um, I went through a, like a dark place of, of <laughs> beating myself up and wondering if I was turning my back on it. And I think, um, and I'm in a role that I didn't know when I was a kid even existed. So um, don't limit yourself, be open to jobs you didn't know exist, companies you didn't know exist. My dad also gave me a really good piece of advice. He says, Aaron, you really can't make a mistake. You just gotta start somewhere. Nice. Can I Steven? feel like we? I feel like we coordinated. <laughs> uh, I mean, what I was thinking, what I've been thinking about is right that you don't limit yourself to what's a traditional career path, right? Yeah. So, you I mean that means very different things for di very different sectors and mm -hmm. very different fields. But I think when I started, it took me a long time to kind of free my mind that I could make choices that didn't necessarily seem logical or sequential to other people, but worked for me and got me the experiences that I wanted to do and, and kind of gave me the skill set that I've got today. And, and um, I think it was kind of getting to a point where I was free to make those decisions and not worry about, did other people see this as the right career move for me that, yeah. that, 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 that I really got to do the things I wanted to do. Nice. Or get to, not got. <laughs> Carla? I would say that uh, sometimes the most painful experiences that you have professionally are the most valuable. Make sure that for every every single thing that you tackle, no matter how um, good or bad it is, that you take something from it. Um, I tell everyone that uh, works in a team that I'm on that, that I expect that they're coming to work every day, giving me what I'm asking them for, but being very purposeful about what skill they're taking away. Every job that you have should be providing you with another arrow for, of your quiver of skills, whether they're hard skills or soft skills, so take those. And I think it's as important to know what you don't like as it is to know what you do. So if you find something that's excruciating, figure out what about it doesn't work for you, and as you start to plot your course going forward, use it as a, as a filter to fine tune the kind of environment that's really going to work for you. Excellent. And I would offer, do what you love, and the money will follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, too many times, I made decisions based on what I thought would make the most money, what I thought would have the most credibility, mm -hmm. uh, would be the best thing for what was next and what I really wanted. And if I could go back to the 20-something JD, I would say, follow your dreams, do what you love, and the money will follow. For me, it wasn't until I, I fell into higher ed uh, that I really was in the place that I was at my happiest, and that's teaching and connecting uh, mm -hmm. with young people. So with that, I would like to ask all of you who are here in the room, and certainly those of you who are on the live stream, uh, to applaud and acknowledge our six panelists. Thank you. Thank you. We invite you to take in much of the rest of Career Week. We are only uh, we are two days down, three days remain, and uh, and definitely whether it is the virtual opportunities or the in-person opportunities. This is an incredible week of uh, privileged conversations. Uh, mine it, use it, do with it what you will. And uh, with that, I will call us complete for the evening, but the bar and the food is still available. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.